Hello and welcome. Um, we are delighted that you are all here tonight. Uh, if you haven't joined us before, the Pulitzer Center is a nonprofit journalism and education organization raising awareness of underreported issues around the globe. In 2022, we supported 275 reporting projects in collaboration with news outlets around the world. We work with classrooms and communities to cultivate public engagement on these issues. And in fact, the journalists with us today are also sharing their work in DC schools this week. The reporting you'll see today was supported by two Pulitzer grants. They pay for travel and on the ground expenses for the reporters. Notably, it's an initiative to encourage coastal reporting. And we have a new initiative this year that we call Your Work environment. And it's a focus on how climate change is affecting work, workers, and businesses, which is why we have changing work and a changing climate for you tonight. Um, you will meet the journalist who reported from deep waters off California and trekked mountains in India. You will also encounter people in these films in the most affected regions with the jobs you might never want to do. Working in 140 degree heat, to build hotels in time for the World Cup in Qatar, or simply maneuvering their streets in their own hometowns that have been made deadly by relentless heat. So now it's show time, and we'll meet again soon. Thank you. So what a great uh, parade of films there. Uh, I have to say, I've watched these films several times, but seeing them on the big screen is a much more emotional experience, I think. And we're also lucky that the films are rooted in the rigor of journalism. And uh, I'm so uh, impressed with the, you know, the people that we have here and the panelists who can describe their work. So um, let me now introduce them. And as I... Uh, as I call out their names, they will raise their hands so that you know who they are. Hal Burton worked in Alaska for more than a decade, reporting on energy and climate issues related to the Bering Sea region. He is a Pulitzer Prize winner twice over. He was part of a, uh, two separate news teams, uh, one at the Anchorage Daily News for public service reporting and at the Seattle Times for breaking news. And a little bit of local history, he grew up here and he was an intern for the late columnist Jack Anderson, if you remember Mr. Anderson. Uh, Aaron Baker of Time Magazine is a senior international correspondent. She's reported from East Asia, South Asia, the Middle East, uh, Europe and Africa. She too is award-winning including with this World Cup investigation, uh, that report has just been recognized for ex its extraordinary photography uh, by Ed Cashy, and he received the... He received the Documentary Journalist Award of, the, of Excellence this month from Pictures of the Year, the oldest photojournalism competition in the world and Tom Laffey was the videographer. Uh, a young woman who is not here, but you will meet on a video soon, is Sidra Fatma Ahmed, who co-produced the Financial Times film. She's based in Delhi, India. For more than 10 years, she's been reporting, directing, and producing video content for media uh, networks there. Her work has been in the Kabar Laharia, Financial Times, the New York Times, Vox.com, and Bloomberg, among others. Andrew Robinson has founded Smith Robinson Multimedia, a collaboration with Dom Smith, so that he can make documentaries that focus on nature. Their work has been in Stat News, The New York Times, and to note the film you just saw, Scientific American. In 2020, they contributed to a multimedia project called An Event of Moon Disaster with the MIT Center for Advanced Virtuality, and that won an Emmy Award. And Fred de Sam Lazaro is executive director of the Undertold Stories Project based at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota. He's been a correspondent for the PBS NewsHour since 1985. 
He's directed films from India and the Democratic Republic of the Congo for the acclaimed documentary series, Wide Angle. He has reported from 70 countries focusing on the roots of poverty and human suffering. So I will start with a general question to get the, uh, get the conversation going, but I know that you probably all have questions, so I'll be brief and let you be the moderator at some point. So generally, these films all look at climate risk and climate change. And some of you were documentary, documenting the problems from far away. The World Cup, India. Was it difficult for you to convince your editors this story was worth telling? Whoever wants to go. <laughs> Uh, I would say that it wasn't difficult to convince them that the story was worth telling. I think we knew it was a good story. I think it was difficult to convince them in this era that it was worth the budget. That, I think, is the biggest problem that we face with this kind of reporting. It's very important, but it's also very expensive. Uh, this was two countries, a team of three. Um, so, yeah, I think that was a bigger issue. So, thank you for the Pulitzer for that. But... That's why it's important to get this kind of funding. I, I think it's important for people to know that you have to frame the stories in a, in a certain way. Hal, your, your videography was wonderful, and Lauren Holmes did that. Um, can you talk a little bit about, newspapers are really strapped. Yeah, um, I wanted to say that uh, for us, uh, it was somewhat of a stretch. This was a partnership between the Seattle Times and the Anchorage Daily News, where I used to work. And it began actually in the winter of that year, where we were looking at a very obvious downside of climate change in the Bering Sea, which was uh, the snow crab populations had absolutely imploded. And the snow crab were a resource that were uh, very important to a lot of the crabbers based in Seattle, where my newspaper is. And it was also a resource that was really important to Alaska because uh, processing plants were based there and generating tax revenue. And then of course, some of the crabbers. So uh, that, uh, uh, that work in the winter, looking at the very uh, obvious uh, uh, what uh, implosion of the billions of uh, snow crab that surveys, surveys had indicated had just simply disappeared over a course of two or three years, got everyone really interested in the issue of climate change in the Bering Sea. And then when the summer came around, it was like, now, Bristol Bay this year, with the warming, it looks like they're actually the sockeye at this point in time benefiting, and there's going to be a record harvest. We need to go back up there, but with the realization that there is going to be a tipping point, and we had actually seen in the peak of the heat wave a couple years earlier, some of the salmon had actually, it had become so warm in the Bristol Bay waters where the fish returned to right at the mouths of the rivers that tens of thousands had actually died. Now millions made it upstream, so it wasn't a disaster, but it showed that uh, as these heat waves are forecast to become more frequent and more intense in the decades ahead, that there could be a tipping point. So we wanted to show, well, here is this resource here is a species that appears to be benefiting, but let's look at what may lie ahead. And then one last thing, paradoxically, just a little bit further north, other species of salmon were having an absolutely disastrous time of it this past summer. And that also was linked by biologists to the warming that had not worked as well for these different species of salmon. So it was a really mixed bag, and some of that nuance, I mean, we got into in print, but the video accompanied that, and it, I wish we could have done more, particularly after seeing all the great work that everyone else did. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I think something that you spoke to in terms of um, the difficulty, like, you know, yes, convincing an editor to pay for this, um, is that uh, environmental reporting, I think, in particular, uh, it can be very time consuming, you know? Um, like, nature doesn't necessarily work on your schedule. And, you know, just like these scientists observe things over really long periods of time, sometimes if you're going to visually capture something, you're going to have to go back in multiple seasons or you're going to need to, you know, and in this case, in the, for this story, we weren't able to do that and it, and it worked out, but um, it, it makes it very difficult to do on a smaller budget and that's why, you know, the Pulitzer Center and resources like that are so important, um, particularly when you're trying to tell a story, uh, in this case, uh, in terms to, to circle back on, on talking to the editor about it, they approached us, we do a lot of work with Scientific American, and they said, hey, we're doing an ocean issue, um, we like an ocean story, and that's when we started spitballing some stories, and I had had in the back of my mind um, the disappearing kelp, which had come up in a number of scientific articles and things in March of 2021, 20, um, and that's when I thought, hey, maybe I could revisit that and actually talk to the scientist and, and we could visualize it and show people actually what's going on instead of it just being a headline. You know, at the risk of betraying more optimism that, than is uh, warranted here, uh, I actually think that we um, have an easier sell for stories that are solutions oriented, that for stories that um, basically depart from the sameness. I mean. I, I went from India to Pakistan last year on the same heat wave story, and you could have the same script practically year to year. Um, South Sudan, what's new? And, and so there's a hunger for any new angle that could help us bring forward a story that otherwise would have a sameness. Um, that's just deathly when you're trying to attract eyeballs to the screen. So in a in a weird sort of way, controlling for the cost. And we had to go up to delay a couple of times. It's not, it's not cheap. But controlling for cost is actually a, a positive when you can find small story stories um, that can help bring this, you know, just keep an awareness going. I wonder if we could show the Sidra, the, the video from Sidra um, uh, Fatma Ahmed. And, you know, Sidra did this amazing report and, and getting a lot of stuff on the ground, but she found one Hi, person everyone. in it. My name is Sidra Fatima Ahmed, and I'm a journalist and documentary filmmaker based in Delhi. Last year, I co-directed the Financial Times film that you just saw. I hope the stories helped explain the impact rising temperatures and heat waves is having on the people here in India. Let me take you through what is happening. In the last couple of years, India has experienced early onset of summer. Due to climate change, we've seen record-breaking temperatures in March itself. Added to that are frequent and intense heat waves up until the monsoons in July. The summer of 2022, which is when the documentary was shot, was the hottest summer of our lives with temperatures going up to 48 degrees Celsius. Despite the extreme heat, the country and its people did not halt. After all, there is economic necessity and livelihoods to take care of. For some, there's relief in indoor jobs, cars, home cooling systems. But for nearly 75% of the country's workforce, working outdoors in these extreme temperatures is the only option. Add to that poor access to electricity, water, cooling systems to help with rest and recovery. The project came to me in the middle of summer. I immediately threw myself in field visits to observe and talk to people about their experiences and how they were getting by. I spoke to people from all walks of life, rickshaw pullers, construction workers, office goers, children, vendors. Some had been under heat stress and many were struggling with productivity, resulting in lesser wage gains. I met most of the characters of my film through these field visits, except one. That's Minakshi, the young girl with two kids you saw in the film. 
While I was going out looking for stories, there was one that was walking into my door every day. Minakshi comes to my home to help me with house chores. She lives in a one-room apartment with her husband and kids. Every day, when Minakshi came to my house, she brought stories of her struggle with heat. Power cuts, unreliable water supply, her children being unwell due to dehydration. I thought to myself, why wasn't anyone talking of Minakshi and other women domestic workers like her? Even though there are more than 50 million domestic workers in India, out of which 90% are women and girls. It's how invisible someone like Minakshi is in the conversation of heat impacts on labor that made me want to tell her story. I'm so glad she agreed to share her story with me and in turn helped tell the story of many others like her. Millions of women workers who are vulnerable with no safeguards to rising temperatures. Knowing Minakshi personally and documenting her story, I realized as the world gets hotter, women from lower socio-economic groups often shoulder a larger burden. Managing work outside in difficult circumstances, but also almost single-handedly managing household responsibilities, cooking, cleaning in the sweltering heat, caring for unwell children and prioritizing their family's health over their own due to lack of resources. I believe the responsibility for long-term solutions for these women is on all of us. As a community, we need to support them and better policies focused on helping such women need to be drafted and implemented. I hope Minakshi's story will help open the discourse on the urgency of the matter. I want to thank Financial Times and Pulitzer for helping me tell this story and to all of you for watching and listening in. Now, full, full disclosure, I used to be the investigations editor for the Financial Times, and I did not know Sidra before she did this story. And when we were planning this, she said, do you think it was lazy reporting to take the woman who walked into my home? And I said, no, because sometimes, uh, the story is right in front of you, and you're not seeing it. And the other thing that I find really extraordinary about Sidra is she's, you know, I think she's 29 years old, but she's done an extraordinary amount of work, and she is the journalist in the global south who knows what's going on, and, and you really can tell her own story and their own story. So I'm, I was really grateful that she, you know, could join us at least by video if she couldn't get the visa. Um, I have more questions, but I would like the audience to have a chance to ask as many as questions as you want. So, you know, let's throw it to the audience, and then I'll come back with more questions if, if we have time. Uh, there was a very surprising element of uh, the extravagant numbers in the sockeye uh, salmon uh, harvest uh, in one of the segments today. And yesterday I saw a film at the American University about polluted waterways, which very categorically stated that the salmon species is, in, uh, is near extinction, which means it is, to my understanding, it should be on the endangered species. And then we hear this, so it's, it's good news, but it's a little to, to collate both these facts. Which one is fact? Is salmon really extinct? There are different uh, species of salmon okay. and runs of salmon. And some of them in the lower 48, where the waters are even warmer, where the dams are located, where they face many more challenges, they are listed under the Endangered Species Act and one of the largest restoration acts in the whole country, if not the world, billions and billions of dollars have been spent trying to restore the once great Columbia River salmon runs that go up uh, the Columbia River, which goes through the Oregon and Washington borders and then into Idaho. And that effort to date has been largely unsuccessful. So if you go to Alaska, there are some runs that are very challenged and some such as the Sakai and Bristol Bay, which are doing phenomenally well. 
but in the lower 48, we have many uh, species that are under protection. And in one last point in California, the once great Klamath River runs, all fishing has been shut down for these fish this, uh, uh, for this year due to the very low returns. So it really is a mixed picture. Um, and you kind of have to look where you're talking about and which runs. Uh, just one final point to say, if you don't mind. Um, the EFF is doing a fabulous job about talking about the various uh, circumstances and factors that are leading to climate change and everything else uh, that is causing, in my opinion, the human species is nearing extinction here. And uh, my suggestion here is, you know, the, the word Anthropocene was coined in 2017. I think that was a, a, a secret, a, a not so well kept secret of environmentalists that the human species on planet Earth is nearing the end of its life. And my uh, suggestion to the EFF is, well, I think we should start talking about what is the future. If planet Earth, I mean, if the human species on planet Earth can no longer exist, do we then talk about what people like Elon Musk, people may consider him a dangerous megalomaniac, but he, we might start to seriously talk about how do we move populations from Mother Earth to that to avoid a complete catastrophe to the, of the human species. Thank you. Um, I guess I would say one thing uh, to, the, to that thought about relocating uh, from planet Earth. Uh, which is, I actually worked on a piece uh, recently, which should come out on the Scientific American website, where I was speaking to an astrophysicist, uh, Mora Baja, at um, uh, uh, University of Texas in Austin. Um, uh, he's really concerned with cleaning up trash in space, which is a very interesting subject, but um, something that he said ab about that is that we have this amazing place where we live right now, um, and we can keep people alive in space for a little while um, at great cost, and uh, both in terms of dollars, but also in terms of their health, uh, because space is not a place where anything lives, as far as we know, or that we have observed. Um, and so if we're thinking about you know, devoting resources uh, at that scale towards uh, looking for a new home, um, but there is a lot of work that we could be doing uh, right here, you know, uh, in terms of the resources that we have and this like amazing place where we, we came from. Yeah. I just wanted to say there was a UN report yesterday that said that the Anthropocene 1.5 centigrade is too late. It's already too late. That's the point. He's referring to the IPC report yesterday that is saying that you know we have 10 years and it's uh, it could be cataclysmic um, and that was the you know the headline news yesterday right. the operative point being it's not too late yet we haven't reached it yet but we have just a few years to be able to stop it from going past so stuff can still be done it's uh, it's not we don't give up now we just have to work harder I, I would even say that there's never a point where you could say okay we're off the cliff and it's too late there's greater and greater, greater impacts as the temperature rises greater and greater. But for the generations to come, I, I, I don't think it's ever right to sort of throw up our hands and say, oh, we're over the cliff, so whatever happens, it doesn't matter. I still think it matters even if we go over 1.5. 1 1.5 1 .5 versus two versus three, these are all enormously important markers in it's worth striving for. I, I, that's just my own personal view. We have a question. Thank you so much. These were incredible films, and you brought so much empathy and, and knowledge. Uh, you were able to share so much. Um, my question is more from a personal side, so I would like to hear from you at a personal level. How do you process the, um, the difficulties that being faced with these uh, difficult situations can bring? Where do you find hope or motivation uh, to keep up the good work and seeing that um, the, the extreme impacts are, are 
escalating and are, are quite daunting. So how, at a personal level, do you um, confront this? And if you have any uh, tips for those of us that are working on climate change. I think back, actually, somebody once asked the television personality, Mr. Rogers, how do you describe or how do you tell children about a disaster they're watching on TV? And his advice to the parents was, tell them to look for the heroes, the, the, the firemen, the nurses, the people that are doing something. It's the same thing with climate. Look for the solutions, look for the heroes, look for the people who are fighting the governments that aren't doing enough, look for the people, the scientists who are coming up with solutions, and look for the inventors, flawed or not, who are coming up with uh, alternatives. So that's, that's how I deal with it. And it's, it's not easy, but it's the best we can do right now. And I want to second that, um, having watched human suffering in theaters around the world um, and never um, have I seen situations that you would call entirely hopeless. Um, I remember the one that sticks in my brain, prompted by your question, is a woman that I met in, in Darfur uh, around 2005 who was escaping uh, enormous genocidal violence and she had walked for seven days straight with one child in her arms and three in tow uh, to safety and to a camp that was, was still so new that they didn't even have tents for people. These are people surviving on berries, um, but she just did what needed to be done in ways, in calling up stamina that in the abstract none of us think we can muster, but when, when you're in that situation, you do it. And, uh, and so I never, um, in situations of extreme human suffering, with the exception of looking at little kids suffering, um, I'm never brought down as much as I'm um, wowed by the enormous courage that people display under extremely difficult circumstances. Thanks. I, I saw a film, <clears throat> David Sirota made a film called Don't Look Up. Sometimes the, uh, the lower budget substack people have good uh, uh, awareness of who, who, who you're listening to and who, who has conflicts of interest. And um, the, uh, Axios DC had an interview with uh, Joni Ernst a couple of days ago and she was complaining about the Clean Water Act and how it holds up construction. And there's, there's a project in Buffalo, a billion dollar state subsidized bill stadium, and they want to waive the EIS. Um, so the, there's, a web, there's, there's a news site called Investigative Post, because Buffalo News is shrinking. It's like went from a th thousand employees and it's going down to 150 or 200. So the small sites like investigative posts are important and they're hiring and, and maybe somebody could do a documentary about the Orchard Park Stadium. Thank you so much. Thank you all for these incredible films. Um, as a climate policy professional, I'm definitely part of your audience, but what I'm really curious as someone who knows that we're never escaping stories um, and journalism about climate change is how you think about approaching these stories knowing that, that you'll probably be doing them for the rest of your careers. How do you think about the ethics involved with the people you interview? How do you think about the tone that you take given you know, the realities of the climate science? Because I suspect it will, we'll be seeing lots of films like these moving forward, but as individual journalists, I'm curious what your personal approach is when you choose to make these types of films. One, one thing that uh, I've increasingly spent time on in recent years is not just, I don't want to say just, but looking at climate impacts, but taking a deeper dive look at the technologies that are supposed to move us forward. Sometimes with a skeptical eye, because if we're relying on these technologies and they're not going to do the job as well as we would hope, 
that's really, really important. And there's been a lot of reporting on, rightfully so, on the oil industry and what they knew and when they knew it. Recently, I spent like most of a month looking at heat pumps and we reached out to people to say, how, what is their experience? Like through a call out to our newspaper and then talking to experts and realizing that this is pretty complicated stuff. It's a key part of the strategy in the Northwest to move us off fossil fuels in buildings and how well they work or don't work, whether they have backups that are on fossil fuel is really important. So I think one part of the reporting that we're gonna see more and more shifting to is maybe a more sophisticated investigative approach to the technologies that that we're going to hopefully and the solutions that are going to move us forward. I'm really interested in how we know what we know. I think when we talk about really big topics like climate is inherently huge. You know, it's, it never happens in isolation. Um, and it can be hard to wrap your head around. And I think what we saw today in all these films was like a very specific slice of life, kind of what you were talking about in terms of these smaller stories, like having a new angle and showing you not what might happen, but what is happening today. Um, and just personally, my curiosity lends me to want to go and really find out how we know what we know when big claims like 90% of kelp has disappeared you know, I, my first thought is who is counting the kelp? You know, like that sounds like a pretty boring job or a difficult job, and, and I wanna know how you come up with a number like that. Um, and the answer, uh, the short answer is satellites or what they use, the Landsat. Um, and, and so the way I engage with it is, you know, maybe there are other people who are also curious about how we know when we make big claims about the climate and its interconnectivity. And if I can tell that story and put a human face on the people who are actually doing this work, on the scientists and the researchers who are out there counting the kelp or the sea urchins or whatever, and seeing that those are people who are there and also just observing anecdotally what's happening, then maybe that'll help anchor it for people in a way that just making you know, sweeping statements does not. I think, um for me, so much of what we understand about climate change in the United States is that it's happening somewhere else. It's not gonna impact me. I have AC, so why do I have to worry about how hot it's getting? So my stories, I'm always trying to find the character or the personality that's gonna bring the issue a little bit closer to home. So either through empathy with a Nepali migrant worker or with a story uh, about you know flooding or migrating communities in Alaska, that these are Americans that are actually being impacted. So it's always about trying to bring the story closer to home for me. And I think picking up on that point, one of the benefits of the technology we, we have today is that it connects us far more easily than uh, was, was true when I began my career all those years ago. And so I think we're going to see a lot more collaboration with uh, with journalists around the world, and I have developed relationships um, with people who work locally, tirelessly, for not a lot of compensation, um, but who bring a great deal of wisdom to collaboration. So every, every single piece that I do, practically, um, involves a serious collaboration with, with a, an under-recognized um, partner in country, but but the eyes and ears in our field you know, have just gotten into virtually every corner of the planet. So I'm encouraged by at least that at a time when the field as a whole is in serious, serious peril. And uh, it increases the stock in, in organizations like the Pulitzer Center. And I think we're gonna see a lot of journo entrepreneurship, which is counterintuitive. We know how to tell stories and how to spend money, not to raise it or to make it. Um, so there's a lot swirling around, but there's enough, I think, to, um, to encourage you on, because it's important work. If I can add to that, I, I have been with the Pulitzer Center uh, about a year, 
And I have been working a lot and talking a lot to young Indian journalists. And COVID had a, a, a quite an effect on many of them. They quit their jobs to be entrepreneurs and to be, become their own videographers, tell their own stories that they thought legacy organizations not doing. So I, I am really quite uh, enthusiastic and hopeful because there are more and more journalists from the areas who know the stories well and are just picking up their cameras and figuring out how to use all this great technology that now makes things uh, quicker, faster, and easier to tell stories with. So um, there's lots of room for good collaboration from people here in, in other countries. I do want to give a shout out to the Pulitzer Center because I think they're helping with, with a broader effort to forge a new model of partnership just like you are talking about. And we all know the old model, which was a journalist from America or Europe parachutes into some place far away, hires a fixer, and that fixer sort of arranges a lot of things and great risk. and. I think we're all aware of the shortcomings of that model, and I really welcome, I mean, some of the things the Pulitzer Center is doing in the rainforest in terms of hiring journalists in the thick of things, it's that is some really good stuff. I think we have time just for two more questions. Sorry to cut the conversation short. I was short. going just to say the, the gentleman sitting straight in front of me had his hand up for a long time. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll go here and then, <laughs> then here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted to make a brief comment followed by uh, a question. So my comment is um, with regards to the idea of sending humans um, to another planet or to space and abandoning Earth, um, that is uh, uh, an ideological project called long-termism, and I would strongly suggest that everyone here research it, um, if only for how dangerous I believe it is. My question is um, regarding the film about India. Uh, so my understanding is that over the past several decades, a central driver of the hundreds of thousands of Indian farmers who have committed suicide um, is a debtor's trap that ha they've gotten themselves into due to Western corporations, agribusinesses, and so forth um, when it comes to forcing them to buy their genetically modified seeds um, and genetically modified herbicides and pesticides. Um, was that a factor that you considered when you were creating the film? Uh, uh, we have had other stories about um, the debt uh, that Indian uh, farmers have gone into. Uh, and that, the story that we had on the Pulitzer site was about them paying for uh, pumping deeper for water and, and you know, uh, digging deeper for water. And, but in order to do that, they would have to take out loans and then the equipment. We, we have a very good story actually on the site about that. Um, I don't know if Fred has some more insight to that. Uh, we've done a lot of work in this field from time to time. Um, I have a film that I did for the series Wide Angle called The Dying Fields, uh, which was in the cotton growing area of Maharashtra, uh, which is a large state in western India. And, and debt was an issue. But um, it's far more nuanced than that. There's a whole host of issues that, that uh, account for farmers' distress in general. And, and India, as I needn't tell anyone, is a huge country. It is about to become, if not already is, the most populous country on earth, uh, it, it, according to the UN. And so it's also extremely diverse in places. Um, and, and one of the things, everywhere you go, it's very, very diverse. One of the things I loved about Sidra's film is that it took you northwest, east, and south um, all across the country to see uh, the different predicaments that farmers have. I think the whole debt to um, you know, the, the, the genetically modified Monsanto, which is now Bayer story, while a good one you know, doesn't tell much more than a fraction of the larger story about the plight of smallholder farmers in, in India and elsewhere in the world. The, you know, the largest occupation on earth is farming. The majority of the people in this world are farmers and most of them 
really, really struggle, and, and it, I think it's something short of 2% of all climate finance is targeted at the largest group of people on Earth, of, of, of earners, and there's something wrong with this picture that needs to be looked at, and I think while we in the media are quite guilty of zeroing in on facile microcosms, I'm as guilty as anybody else, one needs to step back and take a look at the global picture of the multiple factors um, that account for what's happening to smallholder farmers, especially in the geography that we cover at the Undertold Stories Project. Sorry to ramble on, but this is a subject that's close to my heart. I, I love excellent journalism, and I'm curious how covering these stories affects your personal attitude towards your lifestyle, your attitude toward the planet, uh, consumption, consumption decisions in general, uh, especially food. And second, uh, I, I'm kind of perturbed. I'm, I'm, I'm a consumer of PBS at least 10 hours a week. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm honored to, honored to be talking That's a personally. good thing. Okay. Um, it, but one thing about journalism, it's 8 o'clock, sorry, I, I'd be watching Nature Hour maybe on PBS right now <laughs> if, if I wasn't here. But um, that, that in, in, across the platform, j journalists will say, we reached out to blank organization or person and haven't heard back yet. That reach out could be as little as a text, please call me. Well, I, and I know we've, the internet's hurt journalism in terms of not as many journalists are employed today as they were 10 and 20 years ago, but what does the reach out mean? It, 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 organizations just don't get to, they can just ignore a, a investigative journalist request or a, or, you know, or Pretty a, much. A, a, <laughs> I'll, I'll let them, I'll, I'll let okay. other people, but I, I, you know, I've been an editor, an investigative editor, and I've been writing this year, and people, you spend an inordinate amount of time tracking down people to get responses. You still do that. But I'll let my friends discuss that. I'll uh, defer because I mostly talk to scientists who are very excited to talk to me, which is, <laughs> which is why I love uh, that aspect of, of what I do. <laughs> yeah, I, I, my film actually did Exactly, we say that. Uh, we reached out with emails, telephone calls. Um, I tried to reach out to the CEO through another contact with, via email, not telephone for him. And I think in the case of that one construction company, there's not really a penalty for having no comment. Whereas the ILO or the government of Qatar, when I did reach out to them with a, what was looking like a negative story, did come back to me and engage. So I was able to talk to those two entities that have been accused of grievous uh, abuses. So it's kind of a mixed bag, but the ones that stand out are the, the guys that don't respond. Um, do you know the question about, um, I've been covering climate change now for two years officially, and it has radically changed my life, probably much to my daughter's confusion and depression because <laughs> we got rid of the car. We don't eat beef anymore. Um, we got rid of the dryer. Uh, I am always harp harping on her about her choices and how we live our lives. Our vacations are now by train <laughs> instead of by airplane. So yeah, it's, um, it's made me a much more guilty consumer of cheese and leather, uh, but uh, it's also made me a much more conscious uh, consumer of, and extender of, of life, yeah. And I think um, most of us, who call ourselves journalists and want to sleep well at night, um, want our story to be representative. And if, if we haven't dogged a reluctant interviewee enough, um, there's an asymmetry eventually that won't sit well with you. At least I'd, I'd like to think most of us subscribe to tell the story as thoroughly as possible. Sometimes that takes a lot of work. Um, and you'll be surprised at the access. You know, um, Aaron mentioned working in Qatar, uh, I got into Kuwait after two years of trying on a um, tr human trafficking story. And there is a massive human trafficking industry that takes women from Africa to work as domestics in Gulf countries. Um, 
where their countries do not have consular representation even in some cases, and they are just so vulnerable. And through some connections, we were able to get into Kuwait and get an interview with the relevant authorities, and, and in part because they had moved the needle a little bit. Um, there was a member of the royal family, the Al-Saba family, that actually took this cause on uh, herself. This is all very, very nuanced. You're never going to get a black and white, good guy, bad guy story. Uh, and sometimes you just have to dog it and it'll take a while. And we often don't have a while. So that might account for, for some asymmetry <laughs> that we dread. But we, we try. I, I, I dare say that most journalists really try. I think we're just about done. Uh, I want to thank everyone with the DC Environmental Film Festival that had a hand in setting this up. I, I think this been, has been an extraordinary evening of viewing. And I also want to thank the superb panel here. Uh, I'm, I'm in awe. And I want to encourage filmmakers everywhere to consider doing good work and applying to the Pulitzer Center so that we can pay for your travel and expenses. It's our pleasure. PulitzerCenter.org, and we'll give, we'll give you all the grants that we have available. So thank you so much for coming. We appreciate you. <laughs>